Hi, I'm Sean Fay, and this is Sean This Way. And in this video, I'm joined by a very special guest. As lead singer of Electroprop Trio, Years and Years, his debut album, Communion, has achieved global success. But he's also distinguished himself by being a public advocate for youth mental health and being an openly gay man in the mainstream music industry. His name is Ollie Alexander, and now he's a king under my control. I'm really interested um, to talk to you about being an openly gay man in the mainstream music industry. Yes. I have Will Young, who obviously like, enjoyed my success at the top of the charts um, through Pop Idol, who's become much more vocal in mm. recent months about uh, the impact of being openly gay while famous, um, but also not being able to speak about that um, you know, during the early years of his career. And also the death of the late George Michael, who obviously was kind of a pioneer in that respect, but obviously whose career um, began before being outed. Mm. And you've pretty much been open and out since uh, the start of your music career. Really early on, I mean, obviously everybody knew, you know, like the management team and the people that we all work with and knew that I was gay. Mm -hmm. um, but it was not really spoken about in a way. It was sort of like, oh, you don't need to make that obvious. You don't need to kind of come out and start talking about that. And I actually had one media training session really early on um, with this woman who kind of advised me not to come out. She was like, you don't need to, it doesn't need to be, you don't need to make it a big deal. Like, why should you? Why should you have to express your sexuality? What, why does it matter? You know, which is all kind of like, I, I can see where she was coming from and I like, mm. understand why that might have been the norm for, to tell, you know, like musicians in the past or whatever. So after a certain point, I realized actually I just, I was getting this real anxiety and stress from worrying about, you know, what interviewers might ask me in an interview or like, I felt like everything, all the music was just about me and my identity in a way. So I was like, it doesn't make any sense for me to not talk about this. So yeah. I just made the decision. I did kind of, it did feel a bit like a choice really, really early on to be like, I'm just going to be out as much as possible. And um, then it kind of developed from there. Yeah. And I'm just wondering, because you've actually almost now from that starting point, ended up becoming quite a, vo quite a vocal spokesperson as well, not just openly gay, but about community and political issues. And I think there mm. is kind of a debate around pop music. So really, like, even saying like at the highest echelons of pop music, so um, with Beyonce's formation, there was kind of a lot of discussion about what is the role of artists to talk about politics and whether mm. or not actually there is still a school of thought that political messaging through mainstream music is in some ways inappropriate or is mm. kind of... Uh, shoehorning something that, that doesn't belong there and that it could be damaging for the artist too in that you kind of get boxed in as a professional gay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, totally. And well, uh, have you been worried about that? I, I think that's probably something I prescribed to as well in the past. I thought, you know, well, these people, it's not their job. They aren't politicians. It's not, you know, is it really their job to be discussing these issues? And act, But then I suppose now I've kind of come, I, I have a different mindset about those things and I think we're all kind of living in a time where just, and really being alive is being political, you know, and all the choices and decisions and things you make, probably they do have some political kind of aspect to them, whether you like it or not. And I do think you kind of, if you do have a platform, you, that's a privilege really, that people are listening to what you say, whether, you, so really you can make a choice to kind of be political, overtly political or not. We all have a responsibility as human beings to just kind of try and, and do our best, you know, and that involves kind of helping each other. And I think actually, yeah, if you remain silent and apolitical on, on, on things, you're not really helping anybody or yourself. Yeah. And I think it's kind of interesting in pop music that, with queer communities in pop music, is that actually pop music has always been kind of integral to queer community formation mm. um, and, to, and, and to queer culture's understanding of itself. So th through the prism of gay icons, like from Judy Garland pretty much onwards, mm -hmm. that, um, that queer people sort of denied a place in um, pop culture or visibility have kind of used pop music as well to articulate a lot of their own political struggle. Mm. Um, but there has been this huge displacement that actually there still aren't that many openly queer people in that music and that we still haven't really caught up to that despite mm. the fact that we're supposed to be living in a bastion of um, LGBT legal rights. Mm. I think actually for, for a queer person to reach the same kind of level of, of uh, influence that someone like, you know, Judy Garland or, or Beyonce or, you know, Ed Sheeran to have, they need to overcome so many steps along the way. I think it is going to take a while for a queer person to get to that same level, just because the way, you know, you need to have the support of just so many different groups of people to get to that level, you know, yeah. to then even, whereas I think, you know, it's, so I, d I don't think we're quite there yet. One of the things that you were saying as well, which I do find really interesting, is how historically, you know, a lot of our kind of gay icons have been women, you know, heterosexual, cisgendered women who we, you know, LGBT community have really kind of 
deified mm. and, and identified with in a way that's maybe actually not uh, is it that relevant to our to our lives yeah. i don't know but and then it's sort of a question of like why is that and why do we find it so hard maybe to support um a diff another kind of artist, I don't yeah. you know. I, it's, it's, I, I don't know the answer. It's just I feel like men make quite bad gay icons. <laughs> yeah. If you want to be like queer positive, why don't you yeah. make a trans woman your gay icon? Totally. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> um, but yeah, I think that is largely because of like, you know, cis heterosexual women's femininity in pop culture has been kind of like loaded with all this meaning mm. for queer people. Yeah, um, and I think it's the first introduction, I think, Actually, Matthew Todd's book, Stray Jacket, um, had a really good section, I think, on this, on why, it's particularly for young gay men, your first kind of, maybe like, ex your first introduction to pop music is usually with these, like, these, these women who have these almost kind of, who are these like extraordinary women that they often have these quite like tragic storylines in a way, yeah. like Whitney Houston and Britney Spears, and, yeah. we, and we really identify with this kind of, Brittle feminism. Yeah, and, yeah. and that's kind of, uh, because we don't see it reflected in kind of male stuff, I don't know, it's, yeah, it's interesting. It is. <laughs> it is. Not making any points, but it's interesting. Um, so there are different types of, um, you know, of gay representation. You can be out as a gay man, but I think one of the things that I find interesting about political discourse around, certainly like gay male sexuality, is that it is now obviously acceptable on the basis that you conform particularly to heterosexual notions of sex. Mm. But what's quite often there, um, and I was thinking about this um, obviously with George Michael's death, is that if there's any hint of kind of like untoward or kind of especially queerness in sex life or talking about gay men's sex lives mm. in a way that isn't about actually being in a monogamous relationship that mirrors um, heterosexuality, there's still quite a level of harsh media judgment mm. um, about that. And I'm not going to necessarily name names, but there are obviously, there have been examples in the media of gay men, you know, high profile gay men having had lurid stories about their sex lives published. And I'm just wondering, because I know with Desire you did a video that was quite, like, you know, explicitly pointed towards a more sexualized notion mm. of queerness. And do you feel that's quite a dangerous game in particular? You know, I think a lot of the, like you're saying, discourse around um, LGBT you know, rights is all kind of centered around love and, and finding a partner and maybe getting married and like that's all great and really relevant but actually there's so many other different kind of sexualities and different sort yeah. of ways to have a relationship, different ways to love or, or be, a or even if you're asexual, do you know what I mean, that we need to also like sh highlight and give room to. Um, and so that was kind of part of the reason why I was like, actually, you know, I'm just going to try and be as sex positive as possible and it definitely freaked some people out they were like people aren't gonna like this it's too you know and it's but it's crazy you know they ch like that we we have this one music video for um the song worship where I, where you know there's no explicit male or male action at all i lick the the windshield of a car as you do <laughs> you know <laughs> and they were like we can't have that We've got to cut it We've got to cut it out and you just think if, if i was a woman doing this you know there would be no you know, there wouldn't, there would be no, they just, there would be no question. Yeah. But, you know, and the video wouldn't get shown on daytime music channels and it, everything gets edited so much. And it, I think we, we do have a culture that is very sort of doesn't, doesn't want to see any of that side. You know, if, if, it's, if we have a sort of like a safe, I'm sort of talking mostly about gay men here, yeah. but like if we have like a safe gay man in, who feels like non-threatening, then, then that's acceptable. But anything that's sort of other than that, is, I, think, I think can be a bit hard for some people to deal with. I guess this kind of moves on to like the mental, the mental health stuff you're doing in your documentary, uh, yes. Growing Up Gay. I guess one of the things that I'm interested in is when you're approached to do a documentary and they say, well, you've, talk, you've spoken about mental health um, and we're going to do this documentary that's sort of focused around you about LGBT people and mental health. And there have been quite shocking statistics from Stonewall and stuff this year about that. Yeah. is what do you hope in your mind you want to make it because you want to like because we always say like let's raise awareness but it's like how that translates politically I know you've mentioned that you have a crush on Jeremy Corbyn is it that you <laughs> hope that Jeremy's going to be my boyfriend is it <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's all one long bio <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that essentially that you are just like you do a TV documentary then it's written about in the press then you know through social media get shared around, then maybe hopefully someone shows like a junior politician it and then they show it to like someone more senior. Is that what you hope that kind of material? Well, I think that's part of it. I think there's, there is one aspect that is kind of a bit campaign led and like political in a sense, because actually there, there really is stuff that we can do in, in to, you know, a policy level to help 
young LGBT kids, you know, uh, specifically in schools, I really think that would be really, so it would be a really great way of getting like LGBT inclusive sex and relationship education. And that is something that was part of the reason why I wanted to make something like that. But also um, really, I think it was an opportunity to kind of access, a, you know, quite a wide audience and introduce something that maybe that they haven't really come into contact with LGBT mental health and you know the idea that like you know families might watch it and parents of an LGBT kid might have a better understanding and that's I think that was kind of that was a big part of, of the decision as well yeah I think there's probably a fear that we just had gay pride in London that there are a huge amount of brands there are lots of people there's a lot of media coverage of that and it seems very much like we're there, everything's mm. accepted, and actually a lot of the legal rights, you know, in Britain, you should be grateful because we actually have some of the most, you know, sophisticated um, and, and, and progressive laws in place, which on the one hand could be true, but on the other, it's kind of like, you know, you have to kind of, the conversation has shifted to be like, well, actually, there's still quite a lot of soci social damage. Yeah, exactly. That takes place that is, it can't be covered by an act of parliament. Yeah, completely. I think, you know, we, we should feel really, you know, good about the, the laws that are in place and the rights that we do, ha that we have achieved so far. But, but, but not forgetting that actually attitudes take much longer, I think, to change. And, and, and the, you know, the experience of, of a queer, a, a young person growing up queer, that experience has not been, you know, magically made perfect because we have almost the same rights as straight people. It just hasn't. And I've really noticed that um, some of my straight friends have been really shocked by the statistics that have come out recently from Stonewall as well mm. about young, you know, young trans people being the most at risk uh, in, in our society. Yeah. Young gay people being bullied at school. You know, it's so prevalent. And I think they, they have been really shocked because I think there is uh, this kind of idea that it's fine and, you know, you can get married and... And this is maybe like a bit of a non sequitur. Is that the right? Yeah, that's that? it. Um, <laughs> I, think you, I think you can go non sec. Non sec. I think you can shorten it. Like I, um, I, I got to a really bad habit of um, of shortening everything until until I like found myself saying Prima Jack. Prima and Jack. Then I was like, that is literally <laughs> like you know, if anything deserves a shortening, it's Prima Jack. Oh dear. Well. <laughs> <laughs> so non sec. Non sec. A non sec to pride. Mm and how, I don't know how you feel about this, but because a lot of my queer friends have quite an uncomfortable relationship with Pride. Yeah. And I think there's a feeling that it's become massively corporate and it's sort of just like an excuse for people to advertise and like for Tesco to mm -hmm. like throw out food and for yeah. you to like, especially this year with London Pride, I know there was, because all their advertising was sort of, it seemed to be centered around like straight people saying it's yeah. cool to have a gay friend or yeah. something. And it felt like, who is pride for anymore like yeah. is it still for our community and if not why and how can we make better help you yeah. know engage how can we better engage with it i think uh, there's a, yeah i think there's a huge difficulty there about um it happened with gay rights and it's interesting that we're probably going to approach that moment um with jeremy corbyn and, and, the, and the conservatives announcing they're going to reform the gender recognition act for trans people mm. is it's very tempting i think when you're offered a bit of kind of like a bit of political solace to just like bite their hand off mm. and um, and increasingly just be grateful and then actually to kind of forget and what that kind of includes is obviously forgetting the people who are most in need in mm. your own community and so I think there is a huge risk with pride events in particular that they stop serving yeah um, I, I like I had a transphobic experience at pride really which is just like for fuck's sake yeah um, what happened Oh, uh, someone was, a woman called me over to her, and so I was expecting it's going to be like, she's going to tell me I'm beautiful. You look she amazing. Did. She did. <laughs> she was like, you're very beautiful, and I was like, thank you. And she was like, you had me fooled, and I was like, that's wow. really odd. And then when I was like, that's actually very upsetting, and you probably should apologise to me, um, she really went off on one, and I was like, you've come wow. to pride. I think one of the interesting things, because mental health is a difficult, more difficult issue, like gay marriage, for example, or. Um, the equal age of consent or rep even repealing section 28 which was done by act of parliament it's actually not that hard for parliament to sit down and pass a vote and do that something like um mental health requires money mm. and i think it's really interesting that um 
a lot of the first things that happen in LGBT rights are the ones that don't actually, like, to actually allow gay people to marry doesn't require any money. Mm. Um, and something like LGBT uh, mental health is actually going to explicitly require oh, yeah. um, giving people free healthcare, mm -hmm. um, albeit mental health services. Exactly, yeah, you're totally right. I mean, LGBT services in that mental health area, it, well, it have just been completely demolished. And also, you know, it does, you're right, it takes so much, it would take money to also train doctors and train GPs to understand maybe LGBT specific issues or how to, do you know what I mean? Mm, like, because yeah. th those, those are relevant. And, and if you have a GP that is completely, doesn't understand that, then you're not gonna have any hope of accessing the, the, the care that you that you need. But to be honest, across the whole sec, you know, across all the health services, the money, there seems to be no money. So it does seem like it's a really, really, um, yeah, tough uphill <laughs> struggle. Yeah. I'm interested about, because obviously some of this is, me you know, related specifically to mental health and isn't just about queer people and mental health, but mental health in general, is that mental health itself is still hugely stigmatised. And I'm wondering, like, you know, how do you feel about, you know, having been very open, what surprises me sometimes is that I feel like we make ground and, you know, the royal family do advocacy for mental health. And then you'll see um, quite stigmatising headlines about use of antidepressants and whether, you know, or... Um, or we just talk about depression and anxiety and not about um, some of the more kind of like ugly side effects of like chronic mental illness. Mm. Um, and I do feel like one of the things is that homophobia and definitely transphobia and uh, mental health politics are gonna always be tied because like, to, to really, to really trash uh, queer people, you have to kind of also, um, you, you also have to be like, they're all crazy. Mm. Um, and, and then you are actually being rude about people who might identify as crazy. Yeah. Like, were you concerned as well about being open about your own mental health topics just for the fear that you might be like, written off? For me, I, find, I found sharing my own st story and trauma was part of my kind of healing process okay. and part of my recovery. Yeah. So, you know, and that has helped me just as, on a personal level, you know, so that's why I sort of don't, don't have to... I have some some conflicting feelings about it, but I sort of knew that for me that that it did help me kind of get over some stuff. But um, yeah, I don't. It's 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 going to take a while, I think, for us to kind of reach a place where we feel like we're addressing things in the yeah. right way. I think celebrity culture um, is you know is quite a difficult one because actually there is quite a lot. Um, you know, if you look at Amy Winehouse, if you look at Britney Spears, 2007, like people still will talk about it as like her meltdown. I know. In quite like, a, like almost like a sassy way. And actually, um, or it's a meme. And I think it's kind of interesting that that's actually quite like, that's perhaps about women and mental health, about if you actually push famous women into a misogynistic male, you know, mm. men's um, celebrity culture, that actually when that kind of cracks and breaks and the, the mental health problems are exposed, but then it becomes, you know, that becomes like a, cons you know, and we totally, all participate in it. I, totally. I mean, I think a large part of celebrity culture is is making fun of women. It, mm. it just is really, and like poking fun at, and I and I get it because you know I, it's so it's so predominant that kind of, and I, and I and I think I probably used to take part in it as well, and then over the years I've gone actually this makes me really uncomfortable and I don't think it's right well, to making fun now, of these women it? yeah. <laughs> so your, stop it's it. your headlines now so like you're yeah. one, you know it'd be your circle of shame so that's yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> it's in your interest yeah now. um you made a documentary that obviously went out on BBC very mainstream um, and was you know obviously talking to young LGBT people themselves but also to people who are not used to these issues I think one of the interesting discussions as well about um, LGBT mental health is how within LGBT politics within communities, within the way that we organise politically, but also socialise our own relationships about the extent to which mental health affects our political relationships with each other. So, mm. um, you know, so for example, um, the sexual competitiveness and body image issues of gay men are often reinforced among gay men by themselves. Mm -hmm. um, but that can be something you literally experience as a young person. I don't experience it anymore because. Um, <coughs> I transcended, uh, <laughs> and uh, you don't experience it anymore because, like, you're a pop star. So <laughs> no one's going to tell you to go away in GAY. Uh, <laughs> but you know, but I'm sure you remember those experiences. And I, I do. And, I, and in trans politics, there there can be a huge, um, you know. On the one hand, I think what's great about kind of queer politics is that I'm sure you've seen a lot of it takes place online, mm -hmm. and that's because I think like young queer people, particularly if you're not fully out, if you're at home, if you're like if you're a trans person, you're in your, your parents' bedroom and they don't know that you are a trans girl or whatever, you can you can go onto Tumblr and you can say my pronouns are she/her and you can incarnate yourself online politically as the person that you can't be 
um, outside of that. I think there's a toxic underside to that too. You know, some of the nicer things like content notices and, you know, being respectful and talking about um, issues of race and intersectionality can be really positive. But on the other hand, it can also cause, you know, people don't realize that they are still traumatized, needing acceptance. Mm -hmm. And that, that can become that kind of talk about um, how to help us can be just as toxic as as what we were doing before. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, you're absolutely right. Like you said it, so I wish I could, yeah, ex articulate that as well as you just did because it's tr <laughs> it's right. You're right. You know, there is this is really a really positive aspect of you know online communities and ha and these and people having access to communities that they otherwise would never have been able to. But at the same time, I think it's made the kind of conversation just very, you know, like one-sided or extreme, and it's sort of just people attacking each other, and not, mm. you know, and, and, and some of the some of the like really intense misogyny I see online is from gay men, or some of the transphobia I see is from gay men, and or from sections, different sections of the community, or racism, and it's not, it's it's hard to know how to address that in a help to it, it, like how we can stop that from happening you know really if we're all and if we're still all doing it online you know it's i don't know if we're going to reach that point where we're yeah because i don't know is it do you agree with the grouping lgbt i always find this interesting mm, do you I, do you believe there's a rationale for that when there's so much diversity amongst us like are we really well, a community is it is it really a sustainable umbrella mm, it's worth it because i think we have a lot of St stuff support we can offer each other and stuff we can learn from each other you know mm. and I think that in that aspect it's good I'm so happy to be grouped in an LGBT queer community because I I feel happy there and it's but it's I think we, it is you know the word community is is kind of problematic in itself you know yeah. and it's like it doesn't it is very hard because we are so diverse and all the experiences are so different you can't you know so i think it does make it hard for lots of people to really feel like in, they are included yeah because they often aren't no really the reality is lots of people don't feel included in the community no that's true and i think it, it depends what you yeah what you mean by it because i think you know what my kind of standard political answer is i think that's a political identity and it's because we have the same enemies politically exactly well i if agree we existed, yeah maybe like a perfectly free society Society where there weren't, there wasn't the kind of like, you know, personal. Because actually, the homophobe on the street doesn't really care how how you identify gender-wise. Mm -hmm. um, they they largely just care about how you look and what, what that means for them. Um, and I think you know, there's that kind of we have the same enemies, but also kind of the same structural things like housing and yeah. you know, experience of prison and kind of you know, yeah. healthcare. Because even like you know, trans people obviously have unique health needs, but like the prep. Yeah, um, struggle in kind of you know it just showed again that kind of yeah I think we like exactly a huge health need. we face a lot of the similar sort of obstacles similar struggles in you know it's hard I, I feel like the, the the possible benefits and positives from being in the community together outweigh uh, currently outweigh what I think the negatives or drawbacks could be yeah. but I think it's really you know I still feel like we can have a conversation about how we are how different parts of the community are different but still support each other and still feel like we can be a community but still recognize the differences i feel yeah. like that is possible it's yeah. just i don't know why we haven't quite got there yet i don't know but it's possible but that's it's possible so, that's so uplifting <laughs> yeah. solidarity is possible guys that seems like the perfect note to tie up where we haven't quite resolved the answer <laughs> <laughs> but it ends the segment nicely so Oli, thank you so much for joining me thank you for having me <laughs> in this wonderful garden <laughs> i know i know we, we, i just thought let's go so extra yeah. um, let me know what you think about lgbt mental health let me know in the comments below tweet me at sean fay use the hashtag sean sway and don't forget to follow navara media at navara media thank you so much for watching bye